actually one of the one of the main reasons for doing the show. The show that we had a hundred years ago, we had all the major paintings except this one. It was in private hands at that point, it was probably unavailable. But now it belongs to the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, and we were able to secure the loan numbers for our show. And it's really one of the big highlights of our show. As you can see, the scale of it is quite grand. It's five feet by eight feet, so it's a very impressive painting. And Birch began this shortly after the news of the battle had reached Philadelphia. Within two or three weeks, he started on the mm. And it's a highly accurate view. Um, that was one of the things he prided himself on was the accuracy of this view. He interviewed people, and he tried to find as much information as possible, even writing Perry, asking him for the arrangement of the ships and what sizes they were and everything else to make this an accurate view of the battle. What's also interesting about this was the frame that it had on it originally. This frame is not the original frame. The original frame would have been two foot high, or two foot thick on the top and bottom of the picture, three foot wide on the sides. It would have had a triangular pediment over the entire frame, and then this all rested on gilded cannonballs. And if you do a little bit of research, the group that Birch belonged to include Thomas Jefferson, Robert Mills, who designed the Washington Monument, Latrobe, all famous architects that loved classical architecture, which tells you that something with a pediment would have been supported with columns. And just if you take a little bit of playing with some numbers, what works out very interesting is this probably had a pair of columns on either side, holding up the pediment and then resting on this elaborate base with the gilded cannonball. And what it also tells you then is that elaborate presentation would have meant that this would have been the highlight of the show where it was first shown in 1814. But also told you that the bottom of the painting would have been about 34, 35 inches off the floor, which meant that when you were standing three or four feet away, it was like you were almost there. You were at the battle. Because this would have filled up your whole range of vision. All right, cinemascope. Exactly, because people didn't have HD TV. Right, they didn't have cameras right. or anything, and right. so this is as close as you could get to actually being there and understanding what had happened. And this shows that moment with the Niagara firing out of both sides at the British. But it's not the it's not really the focal point of the picture. The focal point of the picture is the battered Lawrence. The Niagara is actually sort of way in the back, and it's an interesting depiction. Where's, of that where's scene. the Niagara? The Niagara is actually right here. Oh, okay, that's right. But when this was first exhibited, Birch was praised for his depiction of Lake Erie. The fact that you could d differentiate between ocean waves and lake mm -hmm. waves, and the sort of smoke and um, firepower that you would see during the battle. So it was really a very important picture. I've noticed that, that the waves are, are quite uh, beautiful, and it's, uh, it's like Lake Erie waves. Exactly. So this is really kind of battered. And now you can see how much the Lawrence had suffered, because it was two hours of firing on the British ships and mm -hmm. being fired upon really took its toll on the crew and the ship as well. All kinds of holes in the side of the ship there. And you can see some of the cannons are pointing up, pointing they're down. Skew. They've, they've been right there askew. They've been damaged. So the ship has really suffered mm -hmm. a lot. And if you look around the picture, you can see some British ships have already surrendered. They have struck their colors or are in the process of surrendering. So this is uh, this is striking their colors there with exactly. the f blue blue with the flag, blue or black, whatever color. They're. Blue. And this probably depicts a scene that happened about 2.50, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, because they pretty much know the times when all the different events happened. Mm -hmm. And then as part of that May 1814 exhibition, the catalog actually had a diagram that identified all the ships. So you could actually identify each of the ships that were in the battle, and could, corresponding to what's depicted here. Beautiful. What do we have next? Well, Harry.
Perry wasn't actually finished when he, within just a few weeks of the Battle of Lake Erie, he was helping ferry Harrison's men from Fort Meigs and the shores of Lake Erie up to Ontario because they wanted to also, now they controlled the lake, but they wanted to control the land. And so Perry actually volunteered as Harrison's aide and was at the final real battle that took place in this area, the Battle of the Thames, which was also the battle where the British basically fled. The Native Americans were fighting the Americans, and this was the battle where Tecumseh was killed, which basically ended the Indian Alliance that might have actually helped sway the battle towards the British. And these prints are different depictions shortly after the battle showing it, but they're really more propaganda and less about accuracy, than, like, unlike the images of the Battle of Lake Erie, which were really supposed to be the most accurate views possible. These were not. These were meant as, in some respects, propaganda. Mm -hmm. This one, this fellow here shown large on the horse is actually this Colonel Johnson, who at the time was running for vice president. Mm -hmm. And so this was showing him as one of the important figures in this battle, which you would think General Harrison, General Cass, and Commodore Perry, who were here, would have been depicted as well. And they are shown, but they're these tiny little figures way in the background. Oh, so they marginalized someone who was actually critical for the battle mm -hmm. and focused on the person who was running for vice president. So people would know his name and understand who he was and what he supposedly mm -hmm. did. Yeah, the Rumsey Dumsey who killed the company. Exactly. Mm -hmm. The theme on there was uh, skin the cat. They called him the cat and they wanted his skin. And that's why they were one of the reasons they were upset is because they, they didn't maybe, they never got his skin. And I don't know if this particular piece has anything to do with it. Lore says that he was his body was hidden in uh, the uh, break in the trees uh, back in there, and nobody found him. So both uh, a couple of these trees have uh, have breaks in them. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. And here's his one-eyed brother in Squatawa. Done 20 years after the battle, or actually 10 years after mm -hmm. that battle. It really shows him in the pose of a European. Well, yes. Yeah. It's interesting how these depictions change depending upon the time mm -hmm. they're painted and who's doing it. I think this is rather famous. I think he's, this is about one of the only depictions of him you've right. seen. Well, this is nice. Some of the things that America actually made to commemorate the battle, one of the many things were either mirrors or clocks with a sort of generic scene of the Battle of Lake Erie on it. And this is a reverse painting on a, on a banjo clock. But it's not meant to be historically accurate. So, so this is the period? Yes. Okay. It's around 1820. And then this is really another rare survivor. This is basically a handkerchief that's all printed on cotton. It was printed either in Scotland or England. And then these were printed off in multiples and shipped to the United States for people to buy as a sort of memento of the War of 1812. Did they put them on the wall or did they? No, this was meant to be used. It's it was cloth. A, okay. That's why not many of them survived because they yeah. were inexpensive. So you have all the sort of, you know, key words, united we stand, divided we, we fall in the center. Um, below that there's an eagle, and out of his beak comes, we have met the enemy and they are ours. And then that little ribbon holds up a scene of the Battle of Lake Erie. Mm -hmm. And then yes. below that there's a tablet that talks about war being declared. And then below that is a scene of Lake Champlain, another great naval victory that America had against the British. And then below that is a depiction of the Treaty of Ghent where peace was signed. And show, it shows the American commissioners as well as the British. Mm -hmm. 
So it's really sort of fascinating. We look at it closely. There's words. Didn't we liberty. have uh, the? Uh, did we look at the uh, Treaty of Ghent yet, or not? No. That, well, why don't we just finish up this part of that with that? That right. sounds great. Okay, good. Ooh, here we are. And this is probably one of the other sort of really great things in the show is that we have one of the six copies known of the Treaty of Ghent. This was actually Henry Clay's handwritten copy for himself, signed by the British and American commissioners. So this was one of the legal copies of the treaty. And then you will see standing up behind it are images of four of the five American signers. And it's an interesting story because one of them is, was John Quincy Adams and he was known to walk around Ghent in Belgium. And he ran into an artist. The artist did this little sketch that you see here of him, and then wanted to do sketches of the other commissioners as well. So there's a sketch of Henry Clay, James Bayard, Gallatin, and there's also one of the secretary for the commissioners, Christopher Hughes. So it's really sort of a great combination of images of the men as they looked while they were negotiating with the British. This, these are the seals? There's all the seals for the men and their signatures as well. Mm, okay. And of course, so nobody is, um, at least on the American side, they're all alphabetical. So you have to worry about who would be the first one to sign.